the third and the last speaker of this first session of today is Tim Browning, who will tell us how to stop being poor and become rich. If only. Okay, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to speak. Um, it's a pleasure to help celebrate this important event. Um, I have very many fond memories of visiting uh, the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai. Uh, it's really extraordinary how that institute has been built up into a, a center for interesting events. And uh, it, I certainly feel like it's been too long since I've, I've last visited. So I, I hope to come again soon and congratulate you on your, uh, on your distinguished age um, soon, Balu. Um, but today I wanted to talk about uh, a problem that I was thinking about recently. Um, which is joint work with uh, Dante Bonellis. Um, and it involves a, a sort of basic sieve question, um, but to uh, motivate it, um, I thought I should try and connect it um, to some of um, Balu's work. And in particular, um, so my background is very much in the circle method. And so I'm naturally drawn to um, uh, Balu's important contributions in that area. So um, Waring's problem, as you probably all know, is about representing um, integers as sums of kth powers. And the goal is to try and, or the original goal was to try and understand when you could represent any positive integer as a sum of s kth powers, where s is as small as possible. Um, so that number is called little g of k, and the familiar fact from 1770 is that you can always represent any integers as a sum of four squares. But actually pinning down the values of g of k um, for other um, powers is, is, um, is, a, is a tricky business. Um, and this was a paper that I, I, I really liked um, by, by Balu. Um, so he was obviously very interested in the case of quartics. So when can you represent integers as sums of fourth powers? And he had a, um, a sequence of papers where he produced upper bounds, which went from uh, 21. Uh, I think this is a copy of the paper that proved an upper bound of 20. 20. And then finally in 1986, um, he was involved in a, in, a, in a wonderful effort to finally resolve the fact that um, g of 4 is indeed uh, equal to 19. So um, in that theme, I'm not really going to be talking about Waring's problem in this talk, but um, this version of Waring's problem um, is a taste of, of where we're going. It looks very different. So we're looking at representing an integer as a sum of four mixed powers, um, but they're very special. We have a square we have an nth power and we have two two nth powers. So that looks rather odd, um, but um, we shall see this kind of equation coming up soon in the context of surfaces. Um, so actually this is a pretty hard problem. Um, I think if you write R of capital N for the total number of solutions, then the sort of naive heuristic you might come up with suggests that there should be capital N to the exponent two over N minus a half number of solutions. And so in particular, um, is that not working? Oh, there. so in particular, you don't really expect there to be very many solutions unless this exponent N is small at most three. Um, but um, yeah, we're, we're still unfortunately pretty far from being able to handle even the case N equal to two. So that's a sort of uh, fairly classical problem. We, let's talk a little bit more generally about um, surfaces. And for this kind of problem, uh, as I say, it will arise later, it's hopeless to try and prove any kind of asymptotic formula or even a lower bound. Um, so we will be contenting ourselves with rather, uh, rather weak upper bounds. Our expectations are going to be uh, kept very low. So just to give a bit of general um, context about surfaces. Um, so these are dimension two algebraic varieties. Um, and when they're defined over the 
the rational numbers. Um, there are some very basic questions that we could ask, and this has motivated an enormous amount of research around diophantine equations. So I'm typically uh, going to keep with projective surfaces. So um, if you like, questions about solubility over the rational numbers is the same thing as solubility over the integers. And that first question is really just whether or not there exist rational points on the surface, or if you like equivalently, do there exist uh, non-trivial integer solutions to some corresponding Diophantine equation? That's a very basic question. If there are solutions, um, you can go further, you could ask, um, is that set of solutions dense? Um, is it dense in the Zariski topology? Or is it dense uh, in the Adelic topology? Uh, so in other words, um, for example, is it dense in the reals? If you pick any real point, can you always find a rational point which is close to it on this surface? And finally, um, the other question, which will really be the theme of the talk, is um, if there happen to be infinitely many solutions, um, can you um, say something about their distribution? So if you uh, fix a, a height, can you count how many points there are at that height? So uh, before we get on to the actual surfaces that, uh, that, that, uh, that the focus of this talk, um, let's have a couple of examples. Um, so this is a surface um, that I've uh, come to love. Um, it's a Chatelet surface. It has a, a, a nice affine equation where you're thinking about a reducible cubic polynomial being represented as a sum of two squares. And that's a picture of it. This was drawn by uh, Emmanuel Pear a few years ago. And so this is a surface that I looked at um, with Emmanuel Pear and Régis de la Bretèche a number of years ago. Um, and all of the dots on that picture represent um, rational points, solutions to the equation. So certainly we see some dots. So therefore, the answer to the first question is yes. Um, the, it's not hard to show that the set of rational points is dense in the Zariski topology. They don't all lie on some finite collection of curves. Um, and so the answer to the second question is yes. They are not dense in the uh, Adelic topology. Um, so there are two uh, unconnected components, two connected components of the surface and the red sorry, the black dots correspond to some certain two-addict condition on the denominator of the rational points, and the white spots have the opposite two-addict condition. So it would be impossible to approximate simultaneously a real point on the left, left hemisphere and a two-addict point on the right hemisphere with a rational point. And this was one of the surfaces that we could actually um, count points on using um, universal torsors. Here's another example. Um, I think if you look up uh, Manning's conjecture on Wikipedia, this is the picture you see. It was drawn by Ulrich Derentel. It's a cubic surface. It's the unique cubic surface with all of its 27 lines uh, visible. Um, in particular, it has many rational points. So the answer to the first question is yes, there are points. Yes, the points are, are dense in the Zariski topology. And in fact, yes, we know that the, uh, the points uh, satisfy weak approximation, meaning that they're dense in the adelic topology. Um, and here, unfortunately, we're very far from being able to count points accurately on this surface. So there's a nice result of Heath Brown, where he produces an upper bound, but it's still uh, quite far from the truth, the expected truth. Um, here's a, a further example, which is much easier to study. Um, this is the Cayley ruled cubic. Um, so it has a double line, um, and that um, allows a vibration into, uh, into lines on this, on this cubic surface. So this was something uh, that I looked at with Per Salberger and again, Regis de la Bretèche. And again, there are infinitely many points. They're dense in either topology, and we can count points. And actually here, it's much easier to count points, and it's kind of interesting that you don't get 
um, an Euler product appearing in the leading constant. It's a slightly more um, complicated constant. Okay, so these are the surfaces that I wanted to talk about uh, in this talk. I'm going to call these surfaces hyperelliptic surfaces. Um, they have an explicit equation y squared is equal to x to the n plus x times a binary form f in u1 and u2 plus a further binary form g in u1 and u2. And the difference here is that we are counting these variables with different weights. So it lies in some weighted projective space. So u1 and u2 have uh, weight 1, x has weight 2, and y has weight n. And we view the entire surface as something of degree 2 times n. Uh, so we need to ask the binary form g to have uh, the right degree, namely 2n, and uh, f to have degree 2n minus 2. So this is what I'm going to be interested in, in looking at. Um, as I say, it has degree 2n in this weighted projective space. There's a uh, vibration down to P1 um, and its fibers, um, uh, the, the smooth fibers um, have a positive genus. Um, and interestingly, with these surfaces, there is always a distinguished rational point. So this first question always has the answer yes. Um, so you can take the point x equal to y equal to one and u1 and u2 equal to zero. And that always lies inside the surface. And that's about the only thing we know. So the remaining questions are uh, unknown. Um, so firstly, this question of uh, Zariski density. Um, that is, I guess it's, we don't know, but it's conjectured to be uh, not Zariski dense. But if n is equal to 3, that, it, that is a, a big conjecture in the area. I'll say more about the special case n equals 3 uh, shortly. Um, is it dense in the Adels? Is it dense in QP, for example? Um, again, I don't think we expect that to be true for large n, but when n is equal to 3, um, this is a big conjecture, um, and it falls into the scheme of the brown man in obstruction. And finally, can we count points? Um, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Can we count points of bounded height um, on this surface? Um, well, yes, in the sense that we can count points of bounded height on weighted projective space. Um, but as soon as we've got a, an equation like this, um, we're not able to we're not able to do anything particularly impressive. Now, the case n equal to three has its um, is is really familiar as a particular kind of rational surface um, called the Del Pezzo surface. And if you look up Del Pezzo surfaces in uh, Hartshorn's algebraic geometry uh, book, he defines these things as surfaces of degree d that lie inside projective d space. And in particular, he requires um, d to be uh, between 3 and 9. So the case d equal to 3 is the, the case of cubic surfaces. d equal to 4, these are intersections of two quadrics. But he more or less refuses to admit the existence of lower degree del pezzo surfaces, um, but they do exist. They just lie in um, weighted projective space. So the case n equal to 3 really is a uh, degree 1 del pezzo surface. And I guess the, the, uh, the mantra for these things is that um, the analysis of these surf surfaces, the, the arithmetic of these surfaces, becomes harder as the degree gets smaller. So in fact, degree nine corresponds to projective space, which is very easy to analyze. And degree one is kind of like the hardest example of a Del Pezzo surface. So in some sense, it's not so surprising that we can't say very much. Um, I came across this quote of um, Swinton Dung, which I thought was quite amusing. So he was pointing out that surfaces of degree two and one have no aesthetic merits and they've attracted very little attention. And we should basically ignore them until we've understood what goes on for uh, the interesting case of cubic surfaces. Um, so I suspect that this talk won't do anything to um, 
and disbar you from that opinion. Okay, um, let me say a little, a few words about the risky density, because I think that's a, a, a very interesting topic at the moment. There's uh, been a lot of recent work. So this is the case n equal to three. Um, I'm writing out again what the, the surface looks like. It's y squared equal to x cubed plus x times a binary quartic form plus a binary sextic form. And these surfaces have uh, a nice elliptic vibration down to P1. So the, the fibers are all genus one curves. Um, so you can, there was, yeah, so you can ask about Zariski density of points. It's conjectured that there are, that, sorry, that the rational points are always Zariski dense. Um, we always know that there's at least one, as I've already mentioned. Um, and there's been a number of approaches towards um, proving Zariski density. So there's a, a paper I like from uh, over 10 years ago now by Tony uh, Varily Alvarado. So he has to assume that the Teich Alvarovich group is finite. So that's conditional. And under that assumption, um, he can invoke this work of the Dockchester brothers, which gives you the parity conjecture to show that under certain assumptions on F and G, you get uh, the risky density of rational points. So he studies, yeah, obviously we'll get variations of root numbers of these particular uh, families of uh, elliptic curves. Um, and I think it involves some nice, um, yeah, some nice sieves uh, in, in the argument. So it's a fairly analytic argument. Um, but there are other approaches, and just in the last few years, there's been um, some quite spectacular work by Rosa Winter, particularly, and uh, Julie Desjardins and Lashkareki, um, using kind of different techniques to handle more cases, um, which we can show to be uh, the risky dense sets of rational points. But in this talk, I'm going to be counting. It's uh, more to do with upper bounds. Um, so let's say, uh, explicitly what the counting function is. So again, this is the equation. These are the hyperelliptic surfaces that we want to try and get some handle on. Um, and motivated by the, uh, the weights in the projective space that it lies in, we define a, a slightly funny looking height function where we take um, the maximum of the modulus of u1 and u2, x to the half, and y to the one over n. So uh, this is assuming that we've got basically integers y, x, u1, and u2, which um, are solutions uh, to, this, uh, to this surface. So that's all we're doing. We're just counting the number of integers u1, u2, x, and y, such that this max function is bounded by B and which uh, satisfy the Diophantine equation at the top of the slide. So what can we say about this counting function? Um, well, before I get on to the, the approach that uh, Dante and I were using, we can say something quite uh, simple using a famous uh, result in the literature. Um, so the fombieri peeler bound from 1989 is um, proved to be uh, very powerful and its generalizations have had a huge impact on um, analytic number theory at large, I would say. Um, but all we need here is the original version, which says that um, if we have an irreducible polynomial of degree N, let's call that capital F with integer coefficients, and we count the number of zeros to this polynomial in which the modulus of x and y are bounded by p, then this grows at worst like big O of p to the one over n plus epsilon. So perhaps that's familiar to you already. Um, I, sorry, it's worth, before I go on to the next bit, it's worth pointing out that a crucial aspect of this is that the implied constant really only depends on epsilon and on n, it does not depend on the coefficients of f. That's a uniform bound and that's, um, that's crucial. So here I've written out again what the counting function is. And under the, the well-known fact that any mathematical talk should have a proof, um, 
we can easily prove this lemma. So this counting function that we're interested in is at most b to the three plus epsilon. Um, so what do we do to get that? Well, all we do is we just fix u1 and u2. And then we've got a polynomial in x and y. Um, unfortunately, y is allowed to go all the way up to b to the n. So the one over n saving we get from the bombieri peeler bound is, uh, is more or less uh, annihilated. And so for each, uh, for each u1 and u2, uh, the bombieri peeler bound gives a contribution of b to the one plus epsilon. And we have b squared values of u1 and u2. So overall, that gives us our b to the three plus epsilon. OK, so that's our initial attempt at an upper bound. And um, the goal is to try and prove something better than that. <clears throat> OK, well, actually, that's quite far from the truth, at least if n is equal to 3. So if n is large, I guess we expect um, it to be even further from the truth, actually. But for n equal to 3, we certainly expect there to be um, infinitely many solutions. And um, so here you have to uh, remove some e exceptional curves, some accumulating subvarieties. There happen to be 240 of these exceptional curves that you can identify. And uh, the conjecture, or a special case of this conjecture, is that if you remove all of those curves and count everything that's left, it should grow like b, not b cubed, b times some small power of a logarithm. Um, well, upper bounds are quite hard, it turns out, in this, in this setting. But uh, lower bounds are a bit more approachable, at least if you assume a little bit more about the geometry of the, uh, of the surface that you're looking at. So for example, if you assume that all of the 240 exceptional curves were defined over the rational numbers, then that would be enough to apply um, this result of um, Christopher Fry, Dan Lochran, and uh, Ephthymios Sophos from a few years ago, which gives you a lower bound, which matches the prediction of um, Manin. However, it's a rather special situation that, that it applies to. And if you uh, picked a completely random uh, Del Pezzo surface of degree one or a particular surface with n equal to three, um, I don't think we even know how to uh, improve the lower bound one. So we're quite far from understanding what's going on for typical Del Pezzo surfaces of degree one. So minimal here means that the uh, that the rank of the Picard group is one, that is, uh, so pick, pick S is Z. I think that's a, an open question. Um, well, I think we don't even, we're not even, so each is exceptional curve, which happens to be defined over the rationals, um, contributes B squared. So that's why they're removed in the formulation of the Manning conjecture. But if you allow them, um, we would certainly then expect that there is an upper bound of the shape b squared for the total number of points on these surfaces. Um, and that's, uh, I think that, that's still far from what we're really able to do unconditionally, um, but I, I leave it as a question. Is it true that this is uh, big O of b squared for any s? That's probably true, but uh, difficult. Now, we can sort of, in certain cases, squeeze a bit more out of the, the, the bombieri peeler argument. And I did want to mention this because I think it's quite pretty. Now, the problem with the bombieri peeler bound is, although it's very uniform, um, it, uh, we can't hope to improve it in any generality because it's not hard to see that it's, uh, it's optimal, up to the epsilon at least, in genus zero. So if you take the curve, y squared is equal to x cubed, then you can parameterize all the other solutions. They will look like um, y equal to two, t cubed, x equal to t squared. And if you just count up how many you've got of those in the box minus p to p squared, uh, then you get p to the one third. 
Okay, so the Bombieri pila bound is uh, is tight um, in genus zero, but we're trying to apply it to higher genus curves. We're trying to apply it to integer points on elliptic curves. Um, so actually, um, this point of view was uh, uh, exploited by um, Harold Helfgott and Akshay Venkatesh back in 2006. And they, they observed that on the one hand, if the coefficients of these curves is large, there's actually a little tiny bit of extra saving that you can, that you can exploit in the bombieri pila method. So Diophantine equations or polynomials of large height tend to have fewer solutions and, and you can make that quantitative and put it into the bombieri pila say, uh, method. On the other hand, if, oh, that should be C4 and C6, if the coefficients are small, then you can look in the Mordell Vey lattice following a strategy of Mumford. Um, so Mumford was the sort of proved, he had, a, he had a very nice paper where he, before faultings, was able to count rational points of bounded height on uh, higher genus curves um, by exploiting repulsion in the Mordell Vey lattice. And I think he proved something like log log b as the number of points on a curve of genus two, for example. I mean, now we know that there are finitely many, but the underlying ideas inside um, can be exploited here to show that if you, um, if you have a, an elliptic curve of small height, there is a repulsion among the integer points on this elliptic curve. Um, and that allows you to get an extra saving in that case. So you can combine these two uh, points of view. This was done, for example, by um, Mendes de Costa, a student of um, Harold Helfgott, a number of years ago. And he was able to show using this point of view that you could save a, a tiny power. I don't think he made it explicit, um, but before we had three plus epsilon, but if you carry this plan out, you can get three minus delta. And actually, if you're prepared to assume uh, make some standard assumptions about the growth of rank of ranks on elliptic curves. Um, you can get quite close to that question that I mentioned on the previous slide. So you can prove b to the two plus epsilon. So I think this would follow from probably from Birch, Sunit, and Dyer, um, and and some other stuff. Oh, yeah, all you need to know is that the rank of an elliptic curve grows like little o of the logarithm of the conductor. So if that was true, um, that would be enough um, to, uh, to prove that b to the two plus epsilon bound. So there it stood for a number of years, but uh, just recently um, in a very impressive multi-author paper, which concerned um, a large, well, had a, had a large number of results in it, despite its very short length, um, they were able to produce better explicit upper bounds for the ranks of elliptic curves in the spirit of this hypothesis that I, that I mentioned. And using that, so this was work of Bhargava, Shankar, Taniguchi, Thorne, Zimmerman, and Zhao, um, using that and feeding it into some of the earlier work on this topic, they were able to get quite an impressive value of delta. So they were able to prove the upper bound B to the 2.87. So this is very, very recent. Um, but let me just emphasize, this is all for the case N equal to three. So let me then um, go back to the general case. So this is um, uh, degree, sorry, degree two n hypersurfaces in this weighted projective space. Um, I think we're assuming here that n is odd. Um, and what we were able to prove was an upper bound of the shape b to the three minus one over 20 times log b squared. So our goal was to try and produce an, a sort of upper, sorry, an explicit value of delta in the spirit of the previous slide. Um, but also have an argument which carried over um, to arbitrary hyperelliptic surfaces um, of the shape at the top of the slide. So numerically, unfortunately, this is 
quite a bit worse than the, the multi-author paper that I had on the previous slide in the case n equal to three. Um, but perhaps on the other hand, it's completely uniform. So this uh, implied constant really only depends on n and nothing else. Uh, but more importantly, the, the strategy that was in that Bombieri Pila++ slide um, completely breaks down when um, n is not three, uh, since we don't have the same kind of uniform bounds for ranks of Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves. So um, the proof I wanted to uh, spend the rest of the talk just going over some of the um, steps in the proof. And it won't have anything to do with elliptic curves. It'll be uh, just a, a question in SID methods and exponential sums. Um, so the goal is to try and detect squares in this particular sequence of omegas. Um, so remember, well, maybe it's worth flashing up the previous slide one more time because you can see that we are trying to uh, look at an equation y squared is equal to x to the n plus blah, blah, blah. So really we're trying to detect when the right-hand side is a square. And that's something that we can do um, if we're interested in upper bounds. There's a, a very nice upper bound square sieve by uh, Heath Brown. And this works for any sequence and um, gives you an upper bound for the number of squares in that sequence in terms of the average of uh, this omega function, and then um, a kind of average, which is weighted by um, uh, Legendre symbols. And actually, one of the advantages of this is that you have a lot of flexibility over the choice of primes that you're working with. You can really work with an arbitrary set of primes. Um, uh, so again, the, the proof of this is actually, uh, it's only really one line, one and a half lines. You just play around with this um, um, expression here. Um, so omega of m times the mean square over the Legendre symbols m over p. So the point is that we're, we're taking a square, so that uh, term in the sum and is non-negative. Um, and if you play around with it, you, you recover Heath Brown's uh, square sieve. Now, unfortunately, if you apply this, um, it doesn't help. It gives you a worse than trivial bound for ns of b, unfortunately. So we need to do something a bit more sophisticated. Um, and for that, we could uh, turn to a variant of the square sieve, which was developed by Lillian Pierce. I think while she was a master's student of Roger in, in Oxford. And it's unfortunately a bit more complicated to look at. Um, the key fact is that it allows you to work with two different sets of primes, curly P and curly Q. You can kind of see that the first term uh, looks a lot like the first term we had on the previous slide. Um, it's just an average of the omega. And the second term has the same kind of structure as the one on the previous slide. It's just what we have Legendre symbols made up of a product of four primes now instead of a product of two primes. <clears throat> okay, so the ability to choose primes is going to be crucial um, in, in what's to come. We will be choosing the, the set curly P to be a set of primes of size capital P, the set curly Q to be a size of, size of sorry, a set of primes uh, of size capital Q. We'll make some assumptions about the sizes, relative sizes of capital Q and capital P. Um, I've written down what the, the eventual sizes are, um, but I, I don't think we're going to worry too much about explicitly balancing terms in this talk. Um, we can very easily look at the first term. I, I, I've left out all the middle cross terms. You have to deal with those as well. But the first term is pretty easy. Um, the size of curly P is roughly um, P over log P. And the size of curly Q is roughly Q over log Q by the prime number theorem. And the size, the average of the omega function, well, U1 and U2 go up to, uh, go up to B. 
and x goes up to b squared. <clears throat> so we get b to the 4 for that um, m sum. So you can kind of see that we're shooting for something which is bigger than, sorry, which is less than b cubed. So we'll certainly need the product of p times q to be bigger than b for this term to be um, acceptable, let alone the remaining terms. So anyway, let's talk about the remaining terms. Um, so the inner, uh, if you like, oscillatory sum that uh, one has to think about is this sum of omega m against uh, the Legendre symbol m over pq, p prime, q prime. And then I've just written out what that, what that gives you when you substitute in omega. So it's really just a summing over the values of this polynomial. And what we need to do is get a good bound for this, which is valid for typical values of p and p prime uh, being distinct and q and q prime being distinct. So that's a, a concrete problem that we have to solve. <clears throat> um, we are going to um, break um, into residue classes modulo r in a, in a familiar way. So we're going to break for x um, into residue classes modulo r, where r is the product of the primes. So we get a sum over alpha mod r and then we need to, because the Legendre symbol, it really only depends on the value of alpha mod r. Um, and then we need to detect um, how often x is congruent to alpha mod r. And we're going to do that with additive characters. Um, and when you rearrange the sum, um, you're left with um, a, a sum u and a sum g. And the sum u is this sum over u1 and u2, and the sum over alpha mod r, and the Legendre symbol involving alpha u1 and u2, and twisted by this um, additive character. And the g sum is, um, is easy to analyze. It's just a geometric series summed over little x. So g, g is easy. Um, and the, the effort is now directed at understanding the size of U. So uh, U, capital U, is a sum of exponential sums, a sum of complete exponential sums involving alpha. So can we, can we get a good upper bound for this, for typical values of C and typical values of R? So the whole reason for introducing these two different sets of primes of differing sizes was to facilitate an application of the so-called Q analog of van der Kolb at differencing. I've written out what the sum U is again, and I'm going to factor R as R naught R1, where R naught is the uh, product of primes from curly P and R1 the product of primes from curly Q. So the point is that we uh, these exponential sums satisfy multiplicativity. That's important. So we can factor them as the exponential sum involving R0 and the exponential sum involving R1. And that allows us via um, this, maybe I won't go through it in too much detail, but it's fairly standard. Um, it's a sort of application of Cauchy-Schwartz inequality with a particular kind of H you can separate it out into two different sums. There's a sum over u's involving the exponential sum r1, the mean square of that. That turns out to be very easy to analyze here. We can get away with a weaker bound. And the hard, the hard case is looking at what I've called here sigma two. So it's a sum over u and a sum over, and the mean square of a sum over h and the exponential sum involving r0. So I'm, I'm sort of, I don't want to, <clears throat> I don't want to exhaust you with, um, with manipulations involving Cauchy-Schwartz. Um, so you'll have to take my word for it or check it on a piece of paper that if you, um, when you have a mean square like this, you can difference it. You can then extend the sum to residues modulo R0. And ultimately um, you're led to this exponential sum when you do that. So this is a complete exponential sum modulo R0. 
it has four variables. It has these product of two Legendre symbols and a um, additive character thrown into the mix for good measure. And so the goal now, you can forget about everything else. The goal is to try and get a good upper bound for this. And again, you want to do this for typical vectors h and k. And luckily, there's this same um, endemic multiplicativity property, which means that we can just fix attention on the case that R0 is a prime. I mean, R0 is a product of two primes, but you can look at these two factors separately. So we, we're led to um, think about a certain kind of exponential sum over a finite field. So now we're in, we're in good shape for trying to um, exploit some uh, standard results about the sizes of exponential sums over finite fields. Um, so that's what it, it looks like. As I say, it's a four variable exponential sum involving um, a, a mixture of uh, multiplicative and additive characters evaluated at um, uh, various polynomials. Um, so let's think about upper bounds for this. Um, so clearly, the uh, just to get a, a size, uh, compare it to the trivial bound, the trivial bound for this would just be to bring in modulus signs. Uh, we have four variables, so that gives us a p to the four. And we need to get some saving over that. Now, in fact, actually, um, we can't just get away with any saving. Um, one thing we can observe is we can fix S1 and S2. So if we fix S1 and S2 and, and just content ourselves with something trivial over those, then we get a product of two exponential sums, one involving alpha and one involving beta. And these are now both one dimensional exponential sums. And <clears throat> we can appeal to um, uh, the sort of Bayes resolution of the Riemann hypothesis to show that each of those exponential sums is square root p. So there are two of them. And when you combine that with the number of S1 and S2, that gives you um, the, the Vey bound, p cubed. So we've certainly able to prove some non-trivial bound for this exponential sum. Um, we did some digging around in the literature. Um, there's a nice paper by uh, Nick Katz where he looks at certain kinds of singular exponential sums in, uh, in an IMRN paper. Um, but unfortunately, again, when you go through uh, his, 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 his results, um, it turns out that that really just recovers the Ve bound in this particular setting. So again, it gives you P cubed. Unfortunately, those aren't enough to give you anything beyond the trivial bound. So you really need to go beyond that p cubed, otherwise you'll just be back at uh, b to the three plus epsilon that we got pretty easily from bombieri pila So in some sense, the main uh, result or the main work in the paper was to prove a uh, to, to improve this phase bound, and so that's what we were able to do. Um, if you take um, generic, or well, you just need h one and h two and mu one and mu two to not all share p as a common factor then you get p to the five over two, so you save a half. So um, to end, I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about how we approach this exponential sum. Um, so I think the, the methods are quite flexible. Um, what I've done is I've encoded the Legendre symbol as an equation. So it's now just features the additive character in the sum and, and we're summing over the solutions to these two equations. So I've had to introduce two more variables, u and v, because I'm detecting when that polynomial is a square. <clears throat> so that's a bit awkward to work with. Um, you know, it has uh, monomials of all kinds of degrees there. So it's very convenient to try and make this as projective as possible. Now, this is where it's quite useful to have a particular or to have an arbitrary set of primes to be able to work with. Um, so I think if we take, if we demand that our primes are congruent to one modulo n, that allows us to write um, any element of fp as an nth power. So we can replace u squared by u to the 2n and v squared by v to the 2n uh, trivially. And 
by again the the set of non squares um sorry um by using the fact that the set of non squares uh, or sorry the set of non zero points in fp modulo the squares is plus or minus 1 we can again reduce to the case that um, x and y are themselves squares. So that renders our exponential sum a little bit more homogeneous. Um, we have a additive character involving an f, and we have these two, uh, these two polynomials, g1 and g2. f has now become quadratic, as x squared and y squared, <clears throat> and g1 and g2 is now much closer to being uh, homogeneous of degree 2n. In fact, the first polynomial g1 is homogeneous of degree 2n. The second one has this annoying shift by h. Now, to approach this, we um, called upon a, a sort of uh, an approach of Hooley, which builds on um, Deline's work. And it's kind of a convenient catch-all for estimating random exponential sums um, by reducing the, the problem to point counting over a finite field for which we could try and apply um, sort of Deleen mach machinery. So you write down this counting function, which depends on tau. So it's the number of solutions. So it's, it's important here that you're working over arbitrary extensions of your finite field. And you count the number of solutions to G1 and G2 both being zero and F being tau then you can conclude that your exponential sum is p to the k over 2, provided that you can handle the mean square of this counting function away from some uh, predetermined uh, mj. So that was the approach that we wanted to take. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit complicated. We uh, write down the function nj of t. And what we're going to do is just eliminate one of the variables. Um, I guess we're eliminating um, uh, eliminating y using that equation. And we get an intersection of two polynomials. Um, and we are at the same time making it projective so that it's easier to apply standard results by uh, introducing a further variable t. So it's a bit horrible to look at, but it's basically an intersection of two polynomials, very explicit, um, in six variables. And now this intersection is uh, projective. Its uh, polynomials are all homogeneous of degree 2n. And what we can do, um, yeah, so the, the, the task, what we would like to be able to do is apply um, this kind of estimate of Deline. So this tells you that if you have any complete intersection, uh, which is projective and defined over a finite field of dimension three, then the number of points on that complete intersection is uh, q to the power of three, plus an error term, which depends on the uh, dimension of the singular locus of the threefold. So we have uh, an intersection of uh, two quadrics in, uh, in P5. So we have a threefold. Um, it depends on this parameter tau. Um, so if, uh, if we can get enough control over the singular locus of this threefold, then we can apply this estimate of Deline. Then we can feed it into this argument of Hooley and ultimately get an upper bound for the exponential sum that we're interested in. So it, you know, it was a fairly elementary argument, but quite a lot of work was directed at estimating the, uh, the singular locus, the size of the singular locus for this particular threefold that was on the previous slide. And what we're able to do is show that actually outside finitely many choices of tau, um, uh, where that finite number is just, yeah, it just depends on n rather than q. Um, you get something with isolated singularities. So sigma um, would be uh, zero for those. It has dimension zero. And that's what you do. You um, have to, so you're led to take uh, q cubed for the approximation of this counting function. 
And then either you have a good value of tau, so something where the threefold has isolated singularities, in which case the error term um, behaves like Q squared. And you get an upper bound for that. Or the you don't have isolated singularities, but you can prove that um, the dimension is at most one. And so therefore, you get an error term of the size q to the 5 over 2, which is bigger, but there are fewer tau that, uh, that can lead to this eventuality. So when you uh, look at that, you arrive finally at the conclusion that this exponential sum is bounded by p to the 5 over 2. OK, so that is the, uh, the sort of end of the, the sketch of the proof that I wanted to give. Um, you will have noticed that um, this exponential sum has four variables that we're interested in. Um, and so the trivial bound was p to the 4. What we were able to prove was p to the 2.5. So I think it's not hard to see that that's not optimal. Might, one might expect that you get square root cancellation if you work hard enough. And we did think about that for some time. We were unable to do it. And then we sort of lost a little bit of motivation because I guess even if you're able to do this, when you work through the argument, you find that actually um, you, would, uh, you would save an eighth. Um, so that would give you this exponent 2.875. But that's still just a tiny bit bigger than that multi-author paper in the most interesting case of n equal to 3. OK, thanks. OK, hey, thanks, Dean. Let's unmute and thank the speaker. Any questions to the speaker? <clears throat> Yeah, I have a small question, uh, Tim. So in, in Dante's thesis, he also had done some kind of variant of the square C for more general polynomials. Is that something that would be applicable here or is there a lack yeah. of, of Lillian's variant? Uh, you would need a variant. Yeah, you would need an analog of Lillian's uh, ideas. Uh, but it, yeah, it, you're right. It would be interesting. I think I was calling it a, a, a hyperelliptic circle. <laughs> Uh, you, that's not the most general hyperelliptic surface you could write down. So rather than detecting a square as, as we were doing here, you could tr try and detect it being a root of some more general polynomial for which Dante's thesis ought to be useful if you could develop the sort of mm -hmm. Pierce analog. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Okay, thanks. Okay. More questions? Uh, Philip? Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, hello, Tim. Hello. Uh, great lecture. Uh, so about this uh, van der Korput method, so uh, uh, so, so in, in the end, it was a two variable um, uh, or four variable exponential sum. So, but um, what I am wondering, so I am thinking because there is a general, uh, there is a paper of um, uh, Pinksy and uh, Jivu uh, with an appendix by uh, Will uh, Sawin, which mm -hmm. give uh, a general uh, treatment of uh, the Q van der Korput method in one dimension. With, oh. uh, and uh, probably maybe you know this paper. No, I'm embarrassed to say I can't okay. keep up. No, no. Uh, okay, so uh, so uh, it's an archive. Uh, so uh, and but it's uh, one dimensional. Uh, but then you and the, the, so will uh, give the um, criterion relatively simple to make sure that uh, that you can apply A and B as uh, much as you wish. Uh, so, and uh, I wonder if uh, with this in mind, uh, when you go to apply a van der Korput, maybe you could uh, design it to be, uh, so in this light, so um, mm. uh, you see, uh, okay, or maybe, yeah. so you see, uh, apply uh, the van der Korput in uh, one time in one variable and then again, uh, uh, 
with the and follow up the transformation and see whether in the, the end uh, this criterion apply. I, I don't know. Uh, That's an interesting idea. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. I, uh, let me find uh, uh, just one second. Uh, maybe, uh, so I'm just, uh, because uh, often when you have these horrible uh, uh, multivariable exponential sums, uh, if you do it differently, they, they get structured and uh, in the end you lo lose the structure when you open everything. So, uh, mm. one second. Oh, okay. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Just. Where is it? Uh, ah, okay. Uh, is it this? Uh, just. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. It should be. It, it's. An, uh, I've put it on the it chat. I just did it. Yeah, I put it. Uh, where is the chat? I just did it, Philip. Ah, okay. 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 Um, okay. Ah, okay. So, uh, so it's an old paper, but he has uh, had many, many uh, rounds of revisions, uh, and uh, the one in involving uh, Will in the appendix is uh, the most uh, useful, I think. And uh, because I, I see that your object, it has a Legendre symbol and, uh, and then just a linear uh, polynomial phase. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it indicates a Fourier transform, of course. So you have uh, done some uh, A processes and, and then some B. So uh, maybe, maybe it can uh, be useful. Excellent. Thank you. I, I wasn't aware of that. I will have a look. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? I think there are no more questions. Okay, let's thank the, the speaker and all other speakers. Thank you.